What do you know? Failure. The Venture Brothers premiered in 2004, when I was 14. Gear the hell up, because this is going to be a more personal video than some of the others I've made. Have I earned that kind of self-indulgence? Only in this one case, probably. With my most viewed video currently sitting at about 40, not counting some of my older AMVs, I, as much as any baby YouTuber, have cause to analyze Venture Brothers from the perspective of failure. And hey, there's something you can do to change that. Take this pause to like and subscribe, then leave a comment when you're done. You can also follow me on Twitter at below left for more at the intersection of politics and media or just whatever I feel like. Rock on! Anyway, The Venture Brothers premiered when I was 14, at the height of my obsession with Adult Swim. It was the capstone of late summer nights with reruns of Aqua Teen Hunger Force or Sea Lab 2021. I was just the right age for the show in a certain respect, although in hindsight it's a Gen X show for members of Generation X. It was still in the right place at the right time to become one of my all-time favorites. I was old enough to remember when Cartoon Network and the other Turner channels were a dumping ground for old Hanna-Barbera shows. So despite being a core millennial, I was also steeped in the 60s and 70s content that this show was trying to riff on. But a riff belongs to the times, as any number of 80s-obsessed nerd culture black holes can attest. <coughs> Ready Player One. <coughs> what allows something to rise above being a riff on nostalgia is a work that speaks to a wider audience. I kind of want to say human condition here, but is that too pretentious? The show's themes speak clearly and eloquently, but it speaks most clearly to a limited audience. So before I go off for 25 minutes on how awesome this show is, I want to speak about its limitations. What limits the Venture Brothers is also what makes it so resonant with its target audience, and that's the composition of its cast. There are only two people of color in more than bit roles, both of whom play into racial stereotypes, Kano the Man Mountain and Jefferson Twilight, the first a mute Japanese wall of muscle, the second ripped right out of a black exploitation film. There are more characters on the third string who are people of color, but they get even less opportunity to be fleshed out. On matters of gender, the show does slightly better. Dr. Girlfriend is a first string character, but though she has a name, Sheila, She's generally only known by her relationship to a man, whether as Queen Etheria for Phantom Limb, or as Dr. Girlfriend, or Dr. Mrs. the Monarch after her season two marriage. Briefly in the present, and for a time in her backstory, she did ride solo as Lady Au Pair with her murderous moppets in tow. A few women show up in the second string, though limited in what parts of the show they appear in, and all of them flunk the Bechdel test, their character largely being tied to a man in their lives. Triana Orpheus is defined by her relations with her father and with Dean, Serena Ong likewise being a romantic interest for the Venture Boys and shadowed by the affairs of her supervillain father, Wide Whale, Molotov Cocktease, I mean, come on, it's in the name. She's centered around her on-again, off-again relationship with Brock, though she does drive the plot at a few key points independently of him. On the matter of sexual orientation, the show's similarly limited, no lesbians owing to the absence of women, at least none that I can remember from just having rewatched it. But there are three gay men who recur decently frequently. Colonel Gentleman, a pastiche of Sean Connery's James Bond, and to an extent Sean Connery's Alan Quartermain from the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, but how many people really remember that movie? Shore Leave, the ex-secret agent who re eventually returns to the fold and knock on both the gay Navy joke and on Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and the alchemist who's an alchemist and sort of not a stereotype. There are a few elements of the show that age even worse than the lack of diversity. As a product of the early 2000s, it has those comedic sensibilities, meaning calling people gay or retarded still flies. One subplot involves an otherwise glorious character, Colonel Hunter Gathers, a Hunter S. Thompson pastiche to beat them all, but who decides to get a sex change operation to become a woman and then goes back on it. The show plays this off as an extra crazy ploy to infiltrate an all-woman mercenary assassin group, but the jokes around it, they just don't land well now, to say the least. When we look past these shortcomings, the beauty of the show shines through. <laughs> 
The Venture Brothers' ties to failure goes back almost to the beginning. Co-showrunner Chris McCulloch, credited as Jackson Public, Gotta pause here for a second because it's public. Jackson Public. Sorry, man. I assumed with the weird spelling that maybe it was pronounced differently. My bad. Carry on. Brings up the theme in the commentary for the season one episode, Home Insecurity, saying that I, you'll never, you'll permit me to get to the big picture. This show is actually all about failure, even in the design. Everything is supposed to be kind of the death of the space age dream world, the death of the jet age promises. He affirmed this again in a 2008 interview with Vulture, as the third season began. I was always interested in the rust that's accumulated on the space age. Rust. Rusty. It all fits together. The story failure starts with the titular Venture Brothers' father, Dr. Thaddeus Rusty Venture. Rusty is a former vo boy adventurer, a la Johnny Quest, a childhood stolen by deadly, dangerous adventurers left behind a shell of a man addicted to amphetamines that he calls diet pills, with a mountainous, undeserved ego. A lonely man who is nevertheless neglectful of his children, and a business failure who blew an inherited fortune and destroyed a scientific business empire before getting it back through no effort of his own. Rusty is an avatar of decline, and both the adult characters of the show and the factions follow along with that. Here's a quick rundown. Brock Sampson is a kick-ass he-man, but he's already on plan B, or even really plan C of his life, after he accidentally killed a college football player in practice. He's also saddled with the dead-end job of Operation Rusty's Blanket. The monarch is menacing but self-loathing and tied down by his obsession with the failed Dr. Venture. Jonas Venture Jr. inherited his father's genius at the cost of a diminutive body that gives out on him at the end of season 5. Sergeant Hatred's story is a humiliation conga, losing his wife, growing breasts, playing second fiddle to Brock, eventually getting kicked out of the OSI. Billy Quizboy and Pete White are highly educated grown men who live in a trailer in the desert together. Gary, or Henchman 21, is a man-child who constantly seeks validation but finds it just out of reach. Even the whole superhero supervillain game in the show is shown as this kind of self-parody, 9-to-5 work with a heavy bureaucracy instead of a sincere struggle of good and evil. The story of decline in the world of Venture Brothers is thus more personal than it is social or economic. The rust of the space age that Jackson Public mentioned is more about how the super technologies pioneered by people like Jonas Venture Sr. never really found practical application, that they were all a bunch of cool toys for Team Venture and the other superhero supervillain adventurers of the time. The space age was a time of great promise in the real world too. The 30 years after World War II, which saw the dawn of the space age and man reaching the moon, were a time of great promise for average Americans. The era saw rapid improvements in technology, but also saw something rare in American history, equitable economic growth. Due to a variety of factors, that period was a time of rising wages and rising living standards, at least in white, suburban America. The stereotypes of the era were all over American television of the period. The picturesque homes and happy families of Leave it to Beaver, Andy Griffith, Bewitched, or the Brady Bunch portrayed a sunny, comfortable world that for many Americans was the reality. But Rust encroached on reality, too. It's a story that's dominated the narrative of white working-class America since the contraction of American heavy industry that happened in the late 1970s. Take the Billy Joel hit Allentown. For later baby boomers in Generation X, the collapse of old industrial towns was life-defining. It was an inversion of the American dream of just a generation before, a betrayal of it. Joel sang every child had a pretty good shot to get at least as far as their old man got. And that really summarized the sense of failure felt by Americans, especially white American men, growing up around that time. This is relevant because Rusty Venture is just about old enough to be one of the subjects of that song. Born in roughly 1960, and the fandom site says April 30th, 1960, but I'm not finding any corroboration for that in canon, which puts him around 10 when the adventures of the Rusty Venture show would have happened. The later seasons had his father die in 1987, 
While season one said that Jonas died when Rusty was in college, so sitcom floating timelines kind of screw with this. Anyway, there are big differences between the plight of the working class Americans and the lead characters in the Venture Brothers, of course. Namely, that the problems of the Venture Brothers are mostly caused by personal hang-ups and shortcomings and not imposed by choppy economic waters. But the similarities are where the show finds its power. The sense of forsaken dreams, the sense that you can't, as the song said, get as far as your old man got. Many of us probably live with that feeling in one way or another nowadays. Like the ever-popular, my parents at age 30, me at age 30, Wojak memes. I fit that myself. At my age, my dad was married with a kid, me, and had a house while I'm single in a studio apartment. And while I am generally happy with my life, I'd be lying if I said I was completely unbothered by that comparison. That's not to say that this excuses being an asshole, and I'm going with two directions with that. First, the last five years or so have been drowning in think pieces talking about the forgotten American and their angst that supposedly put Trump in power. The only way this is true is if you squint at it and ignore the deep racism behind their real motivations. Trumpism came from a sense of lost glory, for sure, but the lost glory was deeply tied into the sense of losing white privilege, and the sense of material failure was secondary to that. The second point is that many, if not most, of the lead characters in Venture Brothers are not good people. Part of the show's strength is that it doesn't really make excuses for this. It examines, time and again, but never justifies Rusty's bad parenting. It kind of resembles other asshole protagonist-themed comedies, although it's more Bojack Horseman than Rick and Morty, a meditation on how adversity passes on through generations instead of Rick and Morty's more mixed message where they exalt Rick's badass behavior while still clearly labeling it as bad. There are exceptions, of course. The Venture Brothers takes place in a world where henchmen lives in particular are expendable, and a few notable deaths aside, they're not treated as morally significant, just cannon fodder. But on the balance, the narrative voice of the series has a strong enough moral compass that it helps you sympathize with the characters where they deserve sympathy, while still allowing the characters to be hilarious in how screwed up jerk asses they really are. I brought up Bojack Horseman earlier in that show. Strong in its own right stands as a good comparison point for what makes Venture Brothers really shine. The sympathy that Venture Brothers characters generate from their inadequacy and their struggles with failure is only the beginning of what made this show work. <laughs> The characters of the Venture Brothers all start out mired in failure, as in the list I set up earlier in the video. But it's not an underdog story or anything. The point isn't a hero's journey where the people learn and face their shortcomings and then turn out stronger, and the absence of that kind of easy resolution is really true to life. We grow and we change. We struggle with our problems, sometimes we succeed, sometimes we fail. Most of the time we just tool around with our shortcomings and do the best we can. And that's exactly what you see with the main cast of the Venture Brothers. Like Bojack Horseman, it has a quiet optimism to it, but it goes about it a different way. And let's start out with a few examples. Dr. Byron Orpheus starts the series as a single dad whose wife ran out on him for a better man and who doesn't understand his daughter. He builds a band of magical misfits into a super team to try to get the glamour and glory of Dr. Venture's life. They muddle along for a while, but by the end of the series, while they haven't achieved glory, they've really clicked with each other and really seem to have that kind of chemistry and camaraderie that make it worth it. Billy Quizboy was a trivia ace who ended up getting roped into a crooked quiz show scheme by TV host Pete White. When the scam is uncovered, Billy gets sucked into the OSI and comes out missing an eye and an arm, stuck living with Pete out in a trailer in the desert. But the two are the best of friends and apply their weird skills and some good luck to build a small company and become small-time superheroes in their own right. Gary, aka number 21 that I brought up earlier, was kidnapped by the monarch's henchmen at age 14 and never even finished high school, though he did get his GED, as he noted. Good to have a backup plan. 
He bounces between being a grunt for the slightly less pathetic monarch, living in his mom's house, and talking to his dead friend Skull, alas, poor Yorick style. In the end, he becomes henchman number one, ace sidekick to the mighty monarch slash blue morpho. He becomes, both by accident and design, one of the most kick-ass characters in the entire series. If there's a theme here, it's about finding your people and doing your thing. I don't think it's a coincidence that the few moments of triumph that Dr. Venture himself finds through the series have been when he teamed up with others, like in the early episode Ice Station Impossible, when he works with Billy, Pete, and Sally Impossible. His moment of heroism on Gargantua 2 comes from working closely with Dean as well as with his brother Jonas Jr., and the eventual comfort he finds as CEO of the New Venture Industries comes from his work on long-shot super science projects with, again, Billy and Pete. The closest one to a normal hero story in all of the show is Brock, who starts off in his lowly station as Dr. Venture's babysitter, his mission even called Operation Rusty's Blanket, although that has a double meaning, but he's eventually forced out of that. The strain of the final battle at the end of Season 3 kind of snaps him, and he goes off soul-searching until he finds his way to Sphinx. Sphinx! where he meets other OSI castaways and rediscovers his passion for the work. He and his Sphinx colleagues manage to find their way back into OSI proper, and he ends up right back where he started, just with Dr. Venture being a high-profile assignment instead of a dead-end one. So the show's main example of a regular hero's story becomes a circular there and back again, where Brock ends up back where he started, but with more self-respect and a better understanding of his own wants and needs. The odd relationship he begins with the Amazon Warriana in the New York seasons seems like a good capstone to this, along with being completely hilarious. Her knockoff lasso of truth forces him to admit what he really wants out of the relationship and cuts through self-deception. It sucks that that didn't really seem to last into season seven. By the end of the show, Dr. Venture stands proudest of all. For a longtime fan of the show and someone who felt bad for Rusty, even while recognizing what a jerk he was to the people around him, I really sympathized with him. That sympathy I had extended to him even back before I ran into the difficulties of adulthood, that promise of being a gifted child that wouldn't translate to easy success in the working world. I guess I just had a soft spot for him as an underdog, even though he richly deserved where he was at. At the beginning of Season 6, he gets an unearned win when his er, twin brother, Jonas Jr., dies heroically on Gargantua 2 and leaves the Venture family fortune that he restored by going for consumer electronics instead of grandiose super science projects to his brother. He continues dicking around the way he used to, putting his newfound fortune in peril, but then something interesting happens at the start of Season 7. First they find out that the OG Dr. Venture, Jonas Sr., is still alive, kind of, preserved in the old Problem Light module from the second episode of the first season, which turned out to be the Problem, Prolonged Biological Life Extension Module, a life support system. Now, over time, the series had been hinting that Venture Sr. was morally as bad as Rusty or possibly worse. But these first few episodes of Season 7 cement him on the worse end of that scale, along with being a massive lore backdrop. So, to run it down <laughs> real quick, he had abused his friendship with the Blue Morpho, the monarch's father, blackmailing him with a sex tape of them with a few leading Hollywood starlets of the 1960s, and blackmailing the Blue Morpho into doing the kind of dirty work that he didn't want the glitzy, heroic team venture involved in. He also treated the Blue Morpho's wife to fertility treatments that really amounted to just screwing her and having the monarch ended up as, ending up as Rusty's other brother. After the Blue Morpho dies, a callback to the monarch's origin story way back at the series premiere, Dr. Venture rebuilds him into a cyborg with altered memories, then scraps him as soon as he shows signs of those old memories emerging. The scrapped robot is picked up by the villainous Dr. Z and repurposed, until he gets his memories back fully as a result of the events ending Season 5, and when he goes to confront the preserved Jonas, Jonas immediately tries to paralyze him and get Billy Quizboy to switch Jonas's brain into his old friend's robot body. 
in a series swimming with supervillains, this is the low-down, dirtiest thing anyone tries to do. This is some great storytelling, but it really pays off thematically when Rusty is invited to moderate the 50th anniversary renegotiation of the Treaty of Tolerance between the Guild and the OSI. Rusty actually steps up for once and serves well as a moderator, then realizing that he's dealing with a bunch of children. What did you children come here for? Look, you won't get everything, but you'll get something. Stop with this fairness crap and make some compromises. Then go home to your friends in your goofy costumes and brag about how much you got them. Here he is, one of the most pathetic sitcom protagonists in history, telling off the powers that be in his world and explaining to them that sometimes you need to compromise, that you get too invested in what you were aiming for, that you miss the fact that what you have may, in an objective sense, be just fine. If there's a thesis to the series, it comes here. It's probably fitting that it's the episode that comes after this one that Rusty finally makes his game changer, a working teleporter. Now, since I started with criticism, I'm going to end with some of the all-time greatest things about this show. First, Patrick Warburton's performance as Brock. He has you from the word go, his they hit me with a truck line in the series premiere, or until I had to shave him all the way up to the last episode of the series so far when he goes henchman hunting for the last time. Motherfucking Mecha Shiva! Mecha Shiva! The scene where Gary suits back up as number 21 and hate floats. <laughs> 20 years to midnight in the Galactic Grand Inquisitor. Ignore me! David Bowie, the shapeshifter, and the general love letters to Bowie in particular and 70s rock in general, like Dr. Venture's use of prog rock as his scientific muse. The gated community for supervillains called Malice, a nice place to hate. The battle royale at the end of season three, a tangled mass of henchmen, elite soldiers, and malformed clone slugs. Just so many of the supervillain names. Fat Chance, Lady Hawk and Lyndon B. Johnson, Scare Bear, Radical Left, the hilarious Think Tank, Harangatang and his aptly named wife Battleaxe, Red Death voiced by the incomparable Clancy Brown and Wide Whale. The end of Operation Prom where the Outrider gives Dean the mature adult advice that if he loves someone who doesn't love him back, then the best thing to do to honor her is to just move on. And Dean gives the extremely cathartic, you know what? Fuck you. <laughs> Can't keep myself from laughing. Hank running around in the Countess's boob-bearing battle armor and having no idea for the longest time. The delightfully awkward Augustus St. Cloud. Ooh, goody. Everything about General Trister, voiced by the same actor as Cotton Hill, who thought he was a Hulk but was actually just deluded, shot himself in outer space with a note saying fix it over his cancer-stricken penis, hoping to run into space aliens and over his frozen corpse, but he comes back, battered by the cosmic rays of deep space as an actual Hulk for a heroic send-off. Again, Brock's brief fling with a historically accurate Warriana. Wide Whale being a complete poser. Ong is an ethnically English name, and his wife just spent a semester in Italy. He acts like an Italian-American just for the swagger of being a wannabe mafia don. The deep lore and the many, many callbacks. The best one being Dr. Orpheus's first meeting with the Action Man, where he spooks him by giving a specific prediction of when he'll die of a stroke. In the third season of episode seven, Action Man suddenly feels funny. He has a stroke right in front of Dr. Orpheus. All in all, the music by J.G. Thurwell. In particular, the beginning, and really, even though the series has some great evolution as it goes on, you miss that opening theme song that really just gets you so hyped up for the show. And best of all, the ending music. When an episode ends on a strong note, and then you just go right into that song, and then have your stinger, it's just, ah, so awesome. <laughs>